as you're having your seats, taking your seats, I guess, uh, go and be opening up to the book of Acts, where we'll continue our series, um, picking back up in Acts chapter 21, where we left off last week. Um, and as we're turning there, I I'm, paid the bills when I was in college. I paid the bills working at a restaurant. Um, and for three years, my whole job was to take something that somebody else had grown and harvested and shipped and then cooked. My whole job was to take somebody else's good work and give it to people. Not just to satisfy their, their hunger, but to give them joy and pleasure because it was a really good restaurant. Um, my, as, I, as I come now to the Word of God, as we come together, as I get to be the one who doesn't just read, but also to explain the scriptures this morning, I am excited. Uh, not, not because there's anything special about me, not because I'm smart enough or good enough or loving enough, not because there's anything in me that would help anyone this morning, but because the word of God that has done all things, that is doing all things in our world, he, through his word, is able to help real people with real problems like us. And that's good news, and I'm just the delivery boy. So as we look at Acts chapter 21, we'll be actually having a big meal this morning. We'll be covering almost, yeah, two whole chapters of Scripture. I will not read them all at once, um, but let's get a good dive this morning as we prepare to read Acts chapter 21. We'll start in verse 17. But before we do, let's ask that God would help us. Father, Son, and Spirit, you are good, and you do good, so please teach us your statutes. Teach us what you're like, and what we are like, and what our world is like, and how you are redeeming your people, you are restoring creation, you are bringing good things to pass through your kingdom, through your king that you have raised up, King Jesus, our Savior. We honor you in him, and we pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, that you would open up our eyes and our minds and our hearts, and you would give energy to dead people who cannot live unless you bring life to us. And those of us who you've made alive already, we trust you, Jesus. We follow you. Would you empower us and fill us with your Spirit, the Spirit that filled and empowered you in your ministry? Would you send him from heaven again this morning and make us know your ways? and know how to follow you, and have the energy and the wisdom to do it. Do all this in your name, and for your glory, and for your kingdom, Jesus. Amen. Listen very carefully, because this is the word of God. Acts chapter 21, beginning in verse 17. When we had come to Jerusalem, the brothers received us gladly. On the following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. After greeting them, he related one by one the things that God had done among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified God. And they said to him, You see, brother, how many thousands there are among the Jews of those who have believed. They're all zealous for the law. And they've been told about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses? telling them not to circumcise their children or walk according to our customs? What then is to be done? They'll certainly hear that you've come. Do therefore what we tell you. We have four men who are under a vow. Take these men and purify yourself along with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads. Thus, all will know that there's nothing in what they have been told about you but that you yourself also live in observance of the law. But as for the Gentiles who have believed, we've sent a letter with our own judgment that they should abstain from what's been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what's been strangled and from sexual immorality. Then Paul took them in. And the next day he purified himself along with them and went into the temple, giving notice when the days of purification would be fulfilled and the offering presented for each one of them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. As we start this story, and as we begin to walk through it this morning, let me just ask you a very real personal question. What are you afraid of? Maybe you're like me. I'm a total baby when it comes to spiders. Uh, and y'all, just in the last few months of living here, I've seen more black widows than my whole life put together, and I'm not okay with it. 
Um, maybe for you it's not spiders, it's snakes or roaches or flying roaches. Um, maybe you're afraid of not necessarily stuff you can touch, but places you can be, right? Maybe, maybe you're afraid of enclosed spaces or you're afraid of heights. Well, what, you know, we can kind of laugh at those silly things, even though for real they freak us out, because our deepest fears, the things that we really are most afraid of, are not things we can touch or places we can be. Our deepest fears are of experiences that happen to us, right? right? Something awful, something truly scary, like, like the death of people we love and care about. Or maybe the loss of financial security and the fear that comes with not knowing how the bills are going to get paid. Or, like we see in the story today, maybe you are like me and you also have a deep fear of being misunderstood. Which is another way of saying you are deathly scared of being rejected by the people you care about. Especially the, close, the people who are closest to us. And the counselor and writer uh, Jade Mazarin describes that fear in a way that I think a lot of us can relate to. She says, simply, I have had a need for approval. Somewhere along the journey of our lives, people like me have learned that other people's opinion matters a great deal. And we are only safe if we are watching out for what they think. We are responsible for their thoughts, and we are affected deeply by their thoughts about us then we carry a great burden of trying to live up to other people's expectations, fearful that we're not doing that very thing, and eager to prove our worth to those closest to us. It's no fun. Y'all, that really isn't fun, is it? It's a hard way to live. And, and here's where it's especially hard for those of us who follow Jesus. When we talk about Jesus especially when you and I are trying to persuade other people to follow him because of who he is and because of what he's done. When we do that, our fears will very often come true. We will be misunderstood. We will be rejected. Other people won't think highly of us. And no matter what we say or do, when we work to bring God's kingdom into our world by talking about Jesus, other people really will reject us. And the scripture for this morning shows a very dramatic and painful example of that very thing happening to the Apostle Paul. And y'all know if we've been following his life through the book of Acts, we know that this is not the first time he's been rejected. It seems like that's all Paul does, you know. Some people, every, all they got to do is win, win, win. All Paul does is get rejected, get rejected, get rejected. The book of Acts has been showing us, though, not just in Paul's life, but in the life of every believer in this book, how the resurrected and the living Jesus is bringing the kingdom of God into our world. Even though he has returned to heaven, to the Father's right hand, he is expanding his territory in the hearts and in the minds of all kinds of people who end up following him and trusting him themselves, and he expands his kingdom through us through his people, who make the, the message and the news about him known and who persuade all people to believe in him. But here's what we see this morning. When we do that, when, when we devote ourselves to what Jesus' people have always devoted themselves to and we talk about him and make him known, when we work to bring God's kingdom into our world, we have to be prepared to be misunderstood and rejected. That, that's the big point of these couple of chapters. And in this story, God is preparing us, his people, thousands of years later in a very different time and place. He's preparing us for rejection by showing us really clearly what it looks like. But he also gives us a deeply encouraging reason to do it anyway and to keep pushing through. First off, that the thing I want us to see first, the thing that I think God's word is showing us first is this. We will be misunderstood and we will be rejected by the people we want to be saved. The, the, the people we talk to, the ones we care most about, they are the ones 
who will misunderstand and reject us, even, even when we take precautions not to be misunderstood, and even when we think very carefully about how we will communicate the good news of Jesus to people, our friends and our families, our neighbors, our coworkers, they will shoot the messenger. Ever since chapter 19, Right, that's just a few pages over for us, but this has probably been years in the life of Paul. Ever since chapter 19, we have known that Paul is on a mission. He is going to return to the city of Jerusalem, and then he's heading out for the first time to the capital of the empire, to Rome itself. And in chapter 19, he has been told directly by the Holy Spirit, and since then, indirectly through many people, that when he gets to Jerusalem, it's going to be hard. He's, he's going to suffer. He's, he's going to be rejected. He doesn't know exactly how. That's not revealed to him, but it is not uh, a guess. Paul knows he's going to be rejected, but he's, he's continuing on with his plan to be in the city in time for the Passover festival when religious Jews from all over the ancient world would travel back to their spiritual home. And the first people he visits once he gets there, unsurprisingly, are the leaders of the church in Jerusalem, sort of led especially by the Apostle James. And like we saw back in chapter 15, everyone has reached this agreement that Paul's message and his ministry to non-Jewish people, what, what the Bible calls Gentiles, his message and ministry to the Gentiles is good. He's not changed the message. He's not a rogue agent. <laughs> He's not a heretic. They're on the same page. But since chapter 15, since the last time he's been in Jerusalem, who knows how many years have gone by, rumors have started going around in the Jewish church that Paul is teaching Jews in these other places around the Mediterranean world. When he's going around and preaching the news of Jesus, he is communicating that, hey, you Jewish folks who live in these other cities that I'm preaching to, you can't be Jews anymore. You, you can't follow the traditions of our people. No more Jewish customs. If you follow Jesus, you've got to stop it. That, that's the rumor going around. And you all remember back in chapter 15, the massive a, a council of church leaders from all over the world has to be called. This was so controversial. The question was, do you have to become a Jew and, and undergo all of the rituals for, for men to be circumcised? Do you have to follow the, the dietary laws? Do you have to follow the laws of sacrifice in the temple? Do you have to become a Jew in order to become a Christian? That was the question back in Acts chapter 15, and you remember that the Council of Jerusalem settled it and said no, <laughs> that these laws and these, these parts of the law that God really did deliver for a time and a place, they have been fulfilled. Their purpose has been served. And to demand that those continue to be followed in order to follow Jesus, it's just not right. It's not the message that Jesus has given us. That's, that's been settled. But there are these rumors. These rumors that Paul is not just saying you don't have to do those things. No, the rumors are that Paul is saying you may not do those things. So you Jewish people. You who have grown up hearing the Old Testament read and taught, you who have been circumcised, you who have followed the laws, you have done all these things and that are not just part of your religious observance, they're part of your culture, the way your family lives. Is Paul saying, you got to give all that up or else? Of course not. That, that's not at all what Paul taught. We see, for example, in his letters to the church in Corinth, or to the church in Rome, that Paul was fine with Christians living out Jewish traditions if they wanted to. The problem only came when people, especially to make themselves look super religious, to look very spiritually mature, the problem only came when people like that required obedience to Jewish customs as a part of following Jesus. Maybe even they say, your sins will not be forgiven unless you live out these traditions and these customs. You don't have to read very far in the letter to the Galatians, for example, to see Paul's anger with this. Very literally, Paul says anyone who teaches that can go to hell. Very literally is what he says. They are an anathema. This is not a laughing matter, not a, not a silly minor thing that people can disagree on. He literally says that. But the same man, the same apostle Paul will say, 
as long as it's understood that Christians could take or leave Jewish customs, it really didn't matter. He, as an apostle of Jesus, as his authorized representative, he, he didn't care. He even makes it clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 that sometimes it might be a really good idea, to, to, he says, to live like a Jew, to follow the Jewish customs and to observe the law, if that meant that somehow the people you lived around would be more open to hearing the gospel of Jesus. That they, they wouldn't have this kind of stumbling block or obstacle to listening to you because of the way you lived. It might, it might be strategically advantageous to live like a Jew. But, he says in the same sentence, it might be a really good strategic idea to intentionally not follow the laws and the customs of Judaism. That if that was going to be an obstacle to people, then don't do it. Because... It's not that big of a deal. It, it, it didn't really matter in the kingdom of God coming in the person of Jesus Christ. And side note, it still doesn't. You can take it or leave it. And because it doesn't matter, Paul goes along with the elders of the church of Jerusalem. He goes along with the church's leadership and, and their idea for how to address these rumors. Paul's going to go through a very public ritual purification to show that he doesn't oppose God's law, that these rumors about him are just not right. Also, not only is he going to do it for himself, he's going to pay the, pay the fees, you could say, for four Jewish Christians to finish up this ritual they've gone through as part of what the Old Testament calls the Nazarite vow. We don't know why they undertook this vow. We don't even know who these guys are. The point is not to understand that. The point is not only Paul, is Paul going to purify himself, he's going to do this really public generous, charitable thing and pay the fees associated with these vows coming to a close. Paul is going to publicly keep the law to show publicly that he's not teaching against Jewish culture and Jewish traditions and Jewish customs. And y'all, that, I mean, that's, that seems like a super smart idea, right? That should just clarify everything. That should, that should dispel these rumors. Nobody should have a problem with Paul in Judaism, Right? wrong. That's not where the story goes. Look at verse 27. Starting in verse 27, we see that that is not only not how things go, that the whole thing blows up in Paul's face. Even though he goes along with the elder's plan, he still finds himself in trouble. And while he's gone through these rituals, after everything's done and cleared, and everyone knows that Paul is not against, he's not anti-Old Testament, he's not anti-Judaism, while he's visiting the temple as a part of the Passover feast, he's recognized there by some non-Christian Jews from the province of Asia, like modern-day Turkey. And we remember some of the, the big cities in Asia, cities like Ephesus, cities like Ephesus and Miletus and Troas, and these are all places where Paul has gotten run out of town by the local Jewish folks who are really angry at his message. And some of those folks who hate Paul are also in Jerusalem for Passover. And when he comes into the temple, he gets recognized by some of these Jewish folks. And we don't know, for how, we don't know exactly sh for sure how many folks were in this crowd. It was hundreds or even thousands. The city of Jerusalem, some people guess, it, it, it grew ten times larger, at least, during Passover than what it was during the rest of the year. It's swelled with these massive crowds of religious Jewish people. And when some of them say, hey, this guy, this is the one we've been hearing about. This is the guy who's teaching against the law, against our temple, against our traditions and our customs. What do you think is going to happen to the crowd? The, the, these, these Jewish folks, they rightly understand that, that Paul is proclaiming a message that will bring an end to the ceremonial laws of the Old Testament. They're right there, but they wrongly accuse Paul of something. What do we see in this paragraph? We see that they accuse Paul of bringing a Gentile man into the temple grounds, which is a death penalty offense. They say this because they've seen him around town. This is kind of creepy. It's like, are they hiding behind bushes, like waiting to trap Paul in something? And then they pop out. It's like, aha, there's Paul. We got him. They've seen him around town in the company of other Gentile believers. And they assume that, well, he's brought those guys into the temple. And we actually have archaeological records of this. We, there were signs posted that said, uh, if you are not a Jewish person, enter these 
temple grounds at the cost of your own life. They, they, they accuse this, the Paul of doing that. The whole crowd, they don't know. They don't, they don't know what's going on, but they know that if this accusation is right, then Paul has done stepped in it. And the crowd turns on him. They believe these rabble-rousers. They, they close the temple gates so that Paul can't escape. And once he's trapped, they surround him, and they start beating him to death. And the only reason, the only reason Paul is not killed right then and there is that the Roman army just happens to have an outpost that's directly connected to the temple grounds. There was a flight of stairs of the, of the temple wall. You went up two flights of stairs, and bam, Roman army outpost right there. And when these soldiers inside the barracks hear this noise, they would have been on high alert. This, I mean, this was a massively dangerous time in Jerusalem. Like one little controversy could set the whole city on fire. So when they hear what's going on outside, the, the outpost's commander, called a tribune, he rushes this group of soldiers. It must have been at least a couple hundred of them. He rushes them down this stairway into the temple grounds to prevent a riot, and they have to physically carry Paul out of the mob and up the stairs that connect the outpost to the temple grounds. And at that point, Paul speaks up. Paul, who must have needed serious medical attention at this point. He asks the tribune, he asks the, the commander of this unit if he can speak to the people who just tried to kill him. Maybe because he thought he could calm them down and, and he could prevent the Romans from cracking down on the whole city. And in chapter 22, we see Paul speaking to the crowds. We see him sharing his conversion story with them. And if we've read Acts up to this point, there's not much in this speech that we haven't already read back in chapter 9. This is, an all, this is a very, very, very close repetition of what we've already read. But if we follow along in chapter 22, given what's going on, we can notice Paul emphasizing some details that should deal with the crowd's objections. Their fears about him and his anti-Semitic teaching, supposedly. Some, for, for example, in verses 1 to 5, Paul emphasizes he had been raised in Jerusalem, and he had been discipled by the strictest teachers of Judaism. He was not anti-Judaism. He was not anti-Semitic. It had been pretty weird as a Jewish guy himself. <laughs> and then going on, nobody had been as anti-heresy as, as Paul. Nobody had been as passionate about Judaism and the customs of their people. He'd, he'd devoted his life to these customs, and he'd then devoted his life to hunting down Jews who followed Jesus. He made sure that those people were arrested and thrown in jail and even murdered for their heretical teachings. What happened, though, to Paul? What, what, what changed that guy into this guy? What, what, what changed the heresy hunter into one of the greatest preachers of this teaching? It wasn't because he was an anti-Semite. He only changed because, as we see starting in verse 6, he had a supernatural miraculous personal encounter with Jesus Christ who spoke to him and directed him to go visit another devout Jewish man who was well respected by everybody, a man named Ananias. And he gets to Ananias, he says, hey, uh, I've been sent here. Ananias, a devout, well respected Jewish man who followed Jesus, gave Paul a word from God. He, he says, Paul, God, the God of our fathers, is calling you. He's commissioning you to tell everyone of what you have seen and, and what you have heard. Paul eventually makes his way back to the city of Jerusalem. And here's an important detail for this crowd scene, right? He mentions that he was praying in the temple. Not anti-temple. He's praying in the temple, and he receives a vision from Jesus. Jesus appears to him in a vision and says to get out of Jerusalem. It's not safe for him there anymore. And in verse 21, chapter 22, verse 21, Jesus tells him that he's going to send Paul far away to the Gentiles. And y'all, it's like as the word Gentiles came out of Paul's mouth, that is where he gets himself back into trouble. Because that's where we see, no matter how much explanation he gives, no matter how much he stresses his Jewish heritage or how much he stresses his respect for Jewish people or for the God of the Jews, no matter how much he stressed his love for the temple itself, as soon as he implies 
that God cares about the Gentiles too. And not only that he cares about them, but he was going to actively send someone to reconcile the Gentiles to God through Jesus Christ. The crowd is done. They don't want to hear anymore. He can defend himself all he wants because he won't say anything negative about the Gentiles. They go back to wanting him dead. And what does that show us, y'all? That the crowds treated Paul exactly like they treated Jesus. Y'all remember how Jesus criticized his critics. This is Matthew chapter 11. They were so pig-headed about listening to God's word that they just, you couldn't satisfy them, Jesus says. He, he, he says, when John the Baptist came to you, he basically starved himself to death. He was an ascetic monk, crazy guy living in the desert. And you said, well, he's demon-possessed. But when I came to you, and I preached the good news to you of the kingdom of God coming, and I, I, I ate and I drank. I wasn't this extreme ascetic guy. I, I just eat and I drink with people you don't respect because they're notorious sinners. I, I, I preach the same thing to you. And, and I don't do the thing that made you mad at John the Baptist. But you say that I'm a drunk and I'm a glutton. And when Paul does the same thing, he preaches the same message of the same Jesus, of the same kingdom. And when he preaches to them, they say the exact same thing word for word that they said to Jesus at his crucifixion. Away with him. Which is, in their culture, very simply saying, kill him. I, don't let that guy live. Away with him. Brothers and sisters, you and I really do need to think carefully about how we talk about Jesus with our family and with our friends and our coworkers. And we really do need to think strategically, and we really do need to be sensitive to people's context and their backgrounds. We ought to think about how we share Jesus with people. But this story and dozens of others show us we also have to have a biblical and a realistic understanding of the power that sin has over the hearts of people who don't trust Jesus yet. We are... We are trying to describe a Picasso to a blind person. We are, we are trying to ex, ex, explain, and not just explain, but persuade someone to love and to glorify something that they truly cannot yet understand. Unless God intervenes, the clearest gospel presentation in the world cannot change our minds or our hearts. Our most loving attitude will not soften prejudices. It is only through hearing the good news about Jesus that those walls fall down. But God doesn't promise to make them fall down with every person every time they hear. And so, y'all, let's not let fear of rejection, and, and some of us can go beyond that and not just say fear of rejection. Let's not let actual rejection that has already happened to us, let's not let that keep us from talking about Jesus and serving people in his name. We, we, we have to remember this and be encouraged in a strange sense from this story. Christianity's best preachers have all been rejected by the people to whom they preach. Let's go back even further. Christ was rejected by the people to whom he preached. And so you, you and me, let's, let's be sober-minded. Let's be realistic. Let's not be overly disappointed when they treat us like they've treated everybody else in the past. Let's not be overly disappointed when we are rejected. Let's talk about Jesus anyway. That's not everything the story shows us. That, that's a long first point. Point two is really going downhill. Point three, you're going to ask, is it even a point? It's short. That was, that's a big point one, right? But it's not the only point of this story. Misunderstanding and rejection, they don't just happen at a personal level. We see in this story as it keeps unfolding that rejecting the, go the gospel also happens at a systemic level and at an institutional level. In our world, both secular and religious authorities are just going to misunderstand the gospel. They're going to misunderstand people who believe it and people who teach it. 
we have to understand that we will be misunderstood by individual people we share the gospel with. But secondly, we, we've got to understand we are going to be misunderstood by the authorities too. That these leaders will not get us or like us. The Romans have no idea what's going on with this riot, right? They just heard this noise outside their barracks. Everyone is speaking in Aramaic, a language that almost no Romans knew. They just hear the noise, they gear up, and they run outside. They miss the beginning of the, of the riot, but they don't, even if they'd been there, they couldn't have understood. So they ask, what's going on? And Paul tries to tell them. He speaks to them in, in, in Greek, the language that they would have spoken. He, they, they let him give his testimony. They, he shares his story. But then the crowd gets whipped back up again, and for Paul's own safety, they bring him back inside the army bar barracks, and they ask him, no, for real, Paul, what's all this about? And evidently, they don't believe him. So what do they do with this prisoner they didn't plan on having? Well, they do with him what they do with most prisoners. They try to torture the truth out of him. After Paul speaks to the crowd and they go ballistic, they bring him inside, they strip off his clothes, they tie him to a, a post or a pillar, and they're getting ready to scourge him. In other words, uh, the Roman scourge was like a long whip with long pieces of leather, and at the end of it were little nails or pieces of metal or hard bone. They were just tied together, and they were going to whip Paul with the scourge until he told them the truth. What's awful about this Aside from the obvious, what's extra awful about this is this was perfectly legal. This was totally normal to treat a, a prisoner like this, to, to, to test the truth that they would try to get out of him. Whether Paul's lying or telling the truth, they don't believe what he first says. They're going to make him go through this, and it's perfectly legal as long as the person in custody is not a Roman citizen. And, you know, we might take our American citizenship for granted. Gene, I know you don't since you're a new citizen, but most of, us, most of the people we meet every day, we just assume they're citizens. It's, it's not really a big deal. But in the Roman world, only a very elite group of people ever got the rights and the privileges of being a Roman citizen. It would have been a miracle to these Roman soldiers that anyone associated with this riot was a citizen of Rome. The, the, the tribune comes up to Paul afterwards and says, I only became a citizen after I paid a huge bribe. How, how did you do it? How did you become a citizen? Paul says, well, I was, I was born a citizen. He inherited it probably because his parents or his grandparents had been granted it themselves. They'd rendered some kind of great service to the Roman Empire. We don't know for sure, but this was extremely rare. And when they hear that Paul is a citizen, they realize that they done screwed up big time. Because under Roman law, if you do this to a citizen, he hasn't been brought up on charges. He hasn't been convicted of anything. The, 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 the discipline for this is very just and fair. Whatever they did to him, they will have done to them, or worse. And that makes them pay attention. They listen up. They hold off, not because they believe Paul, not because they accept him. They are just scared for themselves. It's not just the Romans, though, that misunderstand Paul. We see in chapter 23 a council of his own people, his own Jewish religious leadership. They're called together, and they don't accept his message either, y'all. This council was made up of religious leaders of the Jewish people. Maybe, think maybe like the, a, a gathering of all the archbishops of the Roman Catholic Church, something like that. The name of this council, which was made up of 70 Jewish leaders, was the Sanhedrin, a name that maybe sparks some bells for us in some of our minds. The Sanhedrin judged religious doctrinal issues like this. And it's not the first time they've been called to judge somebody for talking about Jesus, is it? No. At least one other time they've done this. They did it 20 years earlier when they judged Jesus right before his crucifixion. Maybe some of these same men had sat on the council in the same room in Jerusalem while Jesus was brought before them. And just like Jesus in chapter 23, verse 1, Paul claims that he hasn't done anything wrong. And just like Jesus, the high priest 
of the Jewish people who sits on the council, the high priest orders him to be slapped for it. And just like Jesus, he is challenged for speaking to the high priest in such a disrespectful way. But unlike Jesus, Paul chooses to speak back to the council. And what he does in speaking back is super smart. It's, it is super clever. This is thinking on your feet. Paul sees from his own knowledge and understanding of the different people on the council, Paul notices that the council is divided. The different members of the council belong to one of two major Jewish denominations. Some of them belong to the denomination that were called the Sadducees. And Luke here, who's writing Acts, Luke actually gives us who don't know much about Jewish culture or customs. In, in chapter 23, verse 7, he tells us the detail we most need to know about the Sadducees. For this context, they don't believe in any kind of spirit world, and they don't believe that the dead are resurrected. That's important to Paul. They don't believe that after you died, you could live again. Because there's other people sitting on the council, not Sadducees. These other Jewish leaders were part of the Pharisee party. And the Pharisees do believe in a spirit world and, critically, in the resurrection from the dead. Paul knows this because before he met Jesus, which party did he belong to? What was Paul's denominational affiliation? Paul was a Pharisee, right? He maybe personally knew some of the guys on this council. So when he sees these are the guys judging me, who knows how long he stood there and thought before he opened his mouth. But when he does open his mouth, he says something genius. He says real quickly, I'm being judged because I believe in the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. Which to us maybe falls a little flat, but do you see what he's doing there? First off, he's opening the door to actually talk about Jesus. The whole reason he's on trial is he believes not only that people are raised from the dead, but there's a way for anybody in the world to get in on that that you don't have to stay dead forever, that you and I and all kinds of people can be raised from the dead to live forever with God in perfect joy and bliss and perfect peace with other people in a perfect world. And I want people to get in on that. That's why I'm in trouble. It's a Bible issue. But secondly, you see how Paul is playing these guys like a fiddle, right? Paul is saying at the same time, hey, y'all, I'm a Pharisee. And the only reason I'm being arrested is just because I believe what Pharisees believe, that there's life after death. And that's super smart. At least it sounds that way, doesn't it? You would think that at, that would at least get the Pharisees on the council interested. And they do get interested. Except, um, instead of listening to Paul, they start arguing with the council members who were Sadducees. <laughs> Paul's clever idea to get people to listen backfires and blows up in his face. It starts an argument that gets so heated that the Roman guards, they don't even understand what's going on. They're, they're just doing their jobs, but they recognize what's, what they say in verse 10. If Paul stays here, in verse 10 we see they're afraid that they are going to tear Paul to pieces. <laughs> so they get him on out of there. So much for being understood by the authorities. Y'all, the Bible tells us that God ordained institutions and authorities to make it possible for everybody in his world to flourish and to thrive. But sin doesn't just corrupt individual people. It corrupts the institutions that we build. It corrupts the organizations that we lead. And the New Testament refers to those institutions and power structures as the world. You know, maybe you're like me, you, you, you were told growing up maybe in the church that worldly stuff is going to movies or dancing or, uh, you know, don't smoke or chew or go with girls who do, that kind of stuff. The Bible, though, presents the world not as something like that in terms of vices and bad habits. The Bible presents the world as something way more sinister. It's, it's the people behind locked doors and, and the people behind the curtains who really pull the, pull the levers and make the decisions. That is the world, this authority that leads all things, that governs all things. And in the New Testament, universally, the world is condemned as opposing God's will. God loves the world. He, he desires to redeem the world, but the world does not want to be redeemed. 
Even when on paper the world, these institutions and authorities, even when on paper they follow good rules and they have good motivations and aims, sin corrupts these institutions. It's like a misfiring piston that just corrupts the whole engine. You, most of it can work fine, but one or two parts breaks down, the whole thing falls apart. And the whole thing might blow up and hurt a lot of people. That's the Bible's picture of authority's effects of institutions' problems because they're made up of sinners. Sinners gonna sin. We, we, we corrupt the things we build. And so God sent Paul and Jesus to preach the gospel to individual people. But he also sent Paul and Jesus to preach to the world, to the authorities and organizations that are called to lead and care for society, but end up crushing it due to sin. Both Paul and Jesus are threatened with the whip, and both Paul and Jesus stand before decision-making bodies, both the Romans and the Jews, that hate their gospel. And both Paul and Jesus speak the truth anyway. Brothers and sisters, a lot of us are never going to stand up and speak or even have the opportunity to do so at uh, an executive board meeting or a shareholders meeting. We're never going to be asked to speak at the courthouse or the state house. We're almost certainly not going to be asked to speak at a meeting of non-Christian religious leaders. But we might. Because some of us have those callings in life. Some of, those, some of us have those vocations and jobs that get us in those situations. And, and if we're called to those places and those situations, we are called to speak like little p prophets. We don't predict the future. But we communicate God's message to the world. Even when we know that the world hates us. Even though we know that they hate the people who bring that message and the message itself. And y'all, look at God's kindness here. Think back in history. Sometimes, because God is kind, speaking up to the authorities does lead to a godly change. For example, this the long hard work of ending the British slave trade, for example, was led mostly and most famously by a man named William Wilberforce, who was converted as an adult, as a member of parliament, who spent the rest of his career bringing down the stealing of people from Africa to bring them to work in the English colonies. He spoke the truth of power to say, in the Old Testament, stealing people is a capital offense. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, man-stealing is listed as an awful sin, we, as a Christian nation, should not do these things. And he was still rejected and mocked for decades. But in his example, it works out. For many of us, though, that's just not the case. We, we write the letters to the government. We, we write to our congressmen. We speak to them. We, we um, stand for integrity and goodness on boards that we're a part of, and it just doesn't seem to do much. But y'all, we, we do stuff anyway. We... We speak up with the opportunities that we have because we are little P prophets who follow a great and a resurrected and a living capital P prophet. Jesus Christ told us the truth about God and about ourselves and about other people. And, and he's calling all of us to tell the truth to the people around us, wherever we happen to find ourselves, whatever jobs we have, whatever our station in life is. Y'all, we as Jesus' people have a prophetic word for the world. And even if and when the world misunderstands and rejects that message, y'all, let's keep standing up and saying it anyway. Let's not be people who abandon our calling or, goodness, let's not be people who abandon the good and the true and the beautiful message about Jesus for whatever reason we may have. One of the most interesting pieces of leadership advice I've ever gotten, I'll tell y'all, it came from two people who don't follow Jesus. In fact, a piece of advice came from a couple of secular Jewish guys. And it's really, it's an excellent book. I hate leadership books. If you're into leadership books, this is a great one, though. In, in their excellent book, Leadership on the Line, Harvard professors Marty Linsky and Ronald Heifetz warn against leading people with a martyr complex. If you're a leader, you can't be a martyr. Doing everything for everybody, trying to keep everybody happy with you, 
trying to make sure that they don't misunderstand you, that they don't reject you. It's awful leadership, they say. The problem is, it's, it's hard, we can understand this, it's hard to respect a leader who doesn't respect themselves. It's hard to respect somebody who won't lay down boundaries, who won't help other people learn how to do their jobs. If you step in and always fix stuff for them, it's, it's not helpful, they say. That's why in their book, Linsky and Heifetz say this, if you act like Christ, you're going to end up like him. If you act like Christ, you're going to end up like him. And I've got to wonder, maybe that's what Paul was thinking as he's sitting back in his cell after this council meeting. Now, the day before, he got beat half to death. His, his plans for the future to go to Rome and, and to preach the good news of Jesus to people who had never heard of it, those plans seemed to be ruined. Even though God himself had promised him that they would happen. And underneath all of that, he must have been thinking, I am misunderstood by Jewish Christians. I am misunderstood by Jewish non-Christians. I am misunderstood by the authorities. I, I think I may be misunderstood by my own church. Does anybody understand me? Does anybody accept what I'm doing for the sake of the gospel as like a good thing? Because it doesn't feel like it. And that's why we have got to camp out for just a minute in chapter 23, verse 11. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And that's... That's exactly what the rest of Acts, all the way to the end of chapter 28, is going to be showing us. How seemingly random and deeply discouraging events somehow lead to Paul getting to the city of Rome and, and telling both Jews and Gentiles about the Savior King Jesus. And, and not only does he make it to the city of Rome, he, he gets to personally share the good news to the emperor's bodyguards. He, he gets to share with the highest level leadership of law enforcement in the Roman Empire. How would that have happened, humanly speaking, if Paul hadn't been arrested? Well, that's what that book of Acts is going to show us, exactly how that happened. And humanly speaking, it wasn't ever going to happen. He, humanly speaking, had to be misunderstood. He had to be rejected. Those things are not an obstacle to Paul's ministry or his life. They are a necessary part of it that he could only see looking back on it. So in this moment of deep despair, Paul not knowing the future, if anything, Paul being super discouraged about the future, his plans and his dreams seem to just be shattered. In that moment, Jesus Christ personally comes to him and says, take courage. The, the Greek, we could translate it real simply as, Paul, buck up. Chin up, man. I am working this out. And, and Paul, buck up. They did the same thing to me. Paul, I, I get you. I understand you. I love you. I'm not calling you to do anything I didn't go through first. So come on, man. Be, be encouraged. Brothers and sisters, be encouraged that no matter who misunderstands us and our gospel, we are understood by our Lord who stands by us, who, who works through us. That's the third thing we got to see. And what's that mean? It means we can buck up. We can take courage. We can be people who are humble and kind and patient and gentle, and you can't make us stop. We can't stop talking about Jesus with people, not because we're jerks, not because we're tone deaf, 
but because, well, to quote the apostles from earlier in Acts, we can't help but talk about what we've experienced. We can accept blowback that comes from skeptical people, even angry people. We can do it day after day, year after year. And that's not just because we have this idea in our minds that this is just how it goes, even though that's true. Because something that's just an idea that never makes it down to your heart cannot sustain your, your encouragement. We, we have something in our hearts, y'all. We have the presence of Christ through his Holy Spirit personally working through us, not just to talk, but to pick us back up when we're super tired of it. What, what does that mean, y'all? Be encouraged by this. What, what, what Christ is sharing, sharing with us is what he shared with Paul. We cannot mess up Christ's plans. We can't. Despite our very best efforts sometimes. We cannot screw up what he's doing in the world. He is, he is like a very patient teacher who tells us to draw a tree and puts his hand over our hand and, and, and makes us draw the trunk and the stems and the leaves. He holds his hand over ours. But y'all, because we are who we are, our hand at some point is just going to shoot over here and bring brown paint to a corner of, of the paper that doesn't need to be there. The, this is the kind of teacher Christ is. Christ gets us back on track. He brings us back to what he wants us to be doing. And when we see the finished product, we see that, that brown splotch over there that really, really felt like a mistake to us. It felt like a, a ruining of what was going on. We look at it and we see, I, I could have never seen this until it was all done. But now that it's all done, the painting wouldn't be nearly as beautiful without that mistake. That little brown splotch in the corner that I felt so bad about, Jesus didn't just like mask it somehow. He, he incorporated it. It was almost like he'd planned it the whole time. Jesus uses our mistakes even in evangelism and discipleship to make masterpieces and how how does that happen well remember what that leadership book said if you act like christ you're going to end up like him that's that's true enough but not in the way they mean it is it Remember not just what a good leadership book says, but remember what God's book, the, the book of books, the book with a capital B. Remember what it says. If the world hates you, know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you. A servant isn't greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they'll also persecute you. If they kept my word, they'll keep yours. I have said these things to you, that in me you may have peace. In the world you will have tribulation. But take heart. Same, same Greek word, buck up. But you, you tired and you scared and you fearful and you anxious disciples, eating one last meal with me the night before I die, take heart. I have overcome the world. Brothers and sisters, take heart. Keep talking about Jesus. And do it with confidence. Let's pray. Lord God, from the love of our own comfort and from the fear of having nothing and from a life of worldly passions, deliver us, O oh God. From the need to be understood and from a need to be accepted, from the fear of being lonely, deliver us, O oh God. From the fear of serving others, from the fear of death or trial, from the fear of humility, deliver us, O oh God. Because we believe you that when we, when we taste your goodness, we will not lack or want for anything. So make us taste and see that you are good. So desire for others to taste for themselves that we couldn't help but keep talking. 
even when we are hated for it. Thank you, King Jesus, for understanding us and for accepting us despite all of our sins and our weaknesses and our brokenness. Thank you. There's no one like you, Lord. So be honored by us. We, we are your deeply loved people. Be honored by us for your kingdom. Amen.